Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, pleasure to be here. I'm here at the mouth of the Columbia River on the other side of the country. Um, just asked by, I think, start with Bill Hubbard. Um, not sure if he's on yet today. Oh, yeah, there you are, Bill. Uh, so thank you for inviting me. And actually, this scene here in the opening slide uh, is uh, the north slope of Alaska from a trip that Bill and I took in 2006. Um, and that will be part of my story, uh, setting us up for our discussion on communicating about climate change. I should note that my colleague Brad Withrow Robinson, a uh, fellow Extension Forester in the Willamette Valley, uh, I'm an Extension Forester on the North Coast. Uh, we work together on climate change a fair amount here uh, in Oregon. Uh, so I'll just get to the next thing here. So first off, uh, just let you know that this is a perspective of a field agent. I'm a county extension forester with a background in forestry and forest ecology uh, and started uh, paying attention to climate change and wondering how to communicate about it. Uh, particularly then got challenged by some early attempts and focused on the need and the challenge about this topic, for, particularly for extension, but in general for our uh, forestry community and communicating climate science and integrating that into uh, forestry. Um, then we want to talk a bit about the role for extension, particularly with your focus uh, in the Southern Pine uh, project. And I got a little background on that from Bill and, and looking at your uh, your work and your proposal, um, and then open it up for our discussion. And so that background really starts with uh, the experience that we've had in Oregon. Uh, working on this particularly for about the last five years. Um, then as I did some more research looking around the country and, and how we have tackled this communication uh, challenge, uh, looking at Arizona as one of the outstanding uh, places where they have a climate science applications program, uh, particularly Mike Crimmins and Chris Jones there, uh, working pretty hard uh, for I think at least uh, six years on um, improving uh, extension and science delivery around uh, climate change. Uh, also here uh, in the coast, uh, and actually both coasts, or all coasts of the country, there's a fair amount of effort in Sea Grant, and our colleagues here on the West Coast have done a lot on that. Uh, we then embarked a few years ago on a, a climate change uh, knowledge, attitudes, and interests um, uh, assessment uh, with a, about 24 focus group sessions in the Northwest. Uh, we have some results uh, coming from that. And also in the group that uh, Bill Hubbard and I worked with, the Western Coordinating Committee on Forestry Extension, uh, that group really has been uh, focusing on this uh, with a couple of uh, trips to Alaska to kind of get us going on that. And I will also point to um, our fairly new uh, Climate, Forest, and Woodlands Community of Practice on the e-extension um, online web delivery. So kind of this, this this particular story, what really got me going on this, uh, being peripherally aware of climate change and climate science, uh, when we all went to Alaska at uh, Fairbanks, uh, got a real immersion in climate science and climate change and in an area where there were uh, pretty big impacts from uh, warming temperatures, and kind of came home from that uh, with the the charge of the challenge to really pay more attention to this and start looking at how would we incorporate this into our local extension programs and you know what does it mean to us locally what's going on uh, with our climate in my case on the the Oregon coast uh, and particularly we're feeling pretty challenged by how big this job might be um, with the topic when we were up in Alaska they had just had two really intense fire years in a row um, many of you may be familiar with how boreal forests tend to burn in very large acreages, and that's a natural part of their cycle, but they'd had two really big years in a row, and about 11 million acres on fire uh, had burned uh, during those two years. And so if you look at, I'm trying to get the pointer going here, uh, this is the, uh, you know, the southern end of Alaska, uh, and the northern end is up here in the Bering Sea. So this is the whole state, and you can see just how much smoke and how much fire was going on from a, a snapshot of a satellite picture uh, back in uh, 2005. So when I came back home, I started looking at uh, the you know the general picture of this global climate change, uh, as we were calling it then, um, and we clearly were in the red zone up here in the Fairbanks area. Uh, when I came back home to Northwest Oregon. 
uh, we were really in a pretty mild area and there hadn't been a lot of climate change and really none of the foresters in my area had really paid a lot of attention uh, uh, nor are they at this time and so clearly it makes a lot of difference and, and that's a starting point we really have to be making this locally relevant and what's going on you know in your forest uh, and that was kind of a starting point for me I did attempt to to tell this story uh, and tested it out on our local groups, um, pretty active with our forestry community. The north coast of Oregon has uh, about a million acres of working forests in my territory, uh, so a very active uh, forestry community. Uh, fairly intensively managed, uh, as you can see you know, in this picture of the Oregon Coast Range uh, with uh, private forests and a usually 35 to 50 year rotation Douglas fir as our primary species. So if you think about this group of foresters, uh, we really are planting a large portion of this landscape um, and over the next 50 years in our case uh, probably we're planting the majority of it in these working forests so there's certainly a lot that will change and could be done if we you know thought we knew what to do um, to anticipate uh, changes in climate and adaptation of the, the the species we're planting but you know the bigger question this is kind of an initial um, you know, question for our group was, you know, so what are we going to do? What can the climate science tell us? And and how are we going to broker the communication in our extension group here in Oregon? And I kind of somewhat naively just started digging into this with our um, local science group and telling the story and giving a few presentations for foresters. And, you know, this opening statement that you see, uh, this is from one of the papers from our local task force on um, adapting forests to climate change. Um, you know, they start out with a typical graph showing the projected uh, changes for our region and the opening statement of climate change resulting from increased concentrations of CO2. And, of course, started running into um, a little bit of pushback just on talking about climate change and about CO2. Um, uh, then the next thing, of course, is our group has been working pretty hard in genetics and tree improvement on understanding uh, the adaptation of our major species, Douglas fir. have a lot of great information from uh, common garden studies on uh, Douglas fir's adaptations to uh, some of the clear climate variables such as, um, you know, growing degree days and, and looking at bud burst and, and chilling and warming. Uh, so we have a pretty good characterization of Douglas fir's um, response to climate. Uh, this is showing a map of the seed zones, um, and this is actually a map of the, based on some climate variables of the mid coast seed zone for Doug Fir, um, and kind of the area that, that this particular seed zone um, is adapted to in the current climate. So if we collected seed from this area, uh, we'd expect you know it to be adapted within this range. And they've made a pretty sophisticated tool uh, that would allow you to take a, a variety of climate scenarios and say, where would this uh, be adapted in the future climate? So this over here is a map of what the one of the projections of future climate. Uh, this would be where the seed zone here would be adapted uh, if we use this particular projection in 50 years. And so you can play with this tool and contemplate how you might move a seed zone and start transferring or, or uh, really enabling what I call assisted migration. And this, uh, actually there's the link to this I'll give you uh, so you could even look at this tool and play with it and maybe contemplate uh, perhaps you've got your own version of this going with Pine. Um, and this is what it looks like online. And I started to play with it and I even started showing it to some other foresters. Uh, but I myself even had this response when I start thinking about these uh, these maps and what all is behind that in terms of A, predicting what uh, climate might be and B, how well connected our genetics uh, science is and you know just how much we know about uh, Douglas fir's adaptation to the climate variables and are we really looking at the right uh, ones. And so many of us, of course, if we look at this, it's a bit too much too fast. But it's certainly uh, an interesting and useful tool to be thinking about the future. Uh, so actually, I thought I'd just stop and check uh, your response to this, um, thinking about moving the seed lots and assisted migration. Um, so if Matt, if you could kind of help facilitate that. Sure, if you'd all just use the chat.
check or the X underneath the participant window to indicate your responses to the first question, which is, do you think assisted migration is appropriate? All right, I've got mostly yeses so far on that one. All right, how about the next one? Are we ready? like a little more hesitation on that one. And if you ask that question of a more general group of landowners, um, and, and by the way, are there, I didn't really have time to meet everybody, uh, I have a feeling of who some of you are, but uh, is, are there many land managers uh, on the ground here in the group? Okay, I don't see any green checks coming on. Uh, so particularly, you can imagine what the challenge might be talking to a group of land managers uh, with this, and I certainly ran into that in my area. Um, so then that takes us to this question of, you know, where do we step in? And uh, I, as an extension forester, was uh, kind of not ready for this. Uh, we do see a real need for communication, and uh, so that's kind of the rest of what I'm going to talk about. Um, Certainly, in extension, a lot of folks are saying, looking to us uh, to be the brokers and make some of these connections. Uh, we're seeing a pretty clear disconnect um, in many cases around this topic in particular. And um, so, what are we going to do about this? And of course, a lot of uh, social scientists and others have been looking hard at, you know, the public uh, attitudes and perceptions. And if we, you know, even look amongst ourselves at where we fit, um, you know, there's a lot of different perspectives on this. And it, knowing something about, you know, the audience and, and who we're communicating with is pretty important. You know, I myself probably have crossed a range of, of these uh, attitudes over my 15 years of looking at this topic. Um, so that's clearly one of the communication challenges is the diversity and the controversy and opinions about it. If you kind of get closer to the ground, um, and here's an example. You know, we're all experiencing extreme weather events as, as we have all our lives. But uh, you know, this was a recent uh, extreme event here in my area. We had our little hurricane. We called it the Great Coastal Gale, uh, and pretty extraordinary uh, sustained winds and exceeding 140 mile an hour on some of the ridge tops and uh, localized blowdowns such as this in 55 um, year old Western Hemlock. And so I'm sure we've all asked this question, you know, is this, is it getting worse? Is it something to do with climate change um, or just, you know, another bad storm? Uh, we had another one of these in 64 uh, and then we had one in 2007. So, you know, what does it mean? And if you, if you look a little closer, particularly uh, those who are studying this communication question, looking at uh, land managers and particularly rural um, farms and forests, uh, you know, a lot of the folks working on the ground are pretty tuned to the weather, obviously, and, and the climate variability. They're used to uncertainty and, their, and, and extremes, and, you know, we all know when something's coming and batting down the hatches, and so how do we put that, the climate change in perspective, um, and depending on where you live, uh, you know, is the direction very clear? Uh, in Alaska, there was some pretty clear uh, warming and some, you know, distinct changes that people have experienced there, but elsewhere it's a lot less clear. And then particularly when you're looking at climate models, uh, you know, there's not a lot of um, real good planning or decision making information that you get from a model who wants to use a, a climate prediction for 50 years out to actually make a solid decision on uh, millions of acres. Um, you know, what, that's not really what models are intended for. Um, so what are we going to do uh, to get started on this and incorporate uh, what we think we know about climate change. And some of the other things that delving into the social science around this is, um, and I'll refer to a paper that I think uh, puts a lot of this together for us um, from the Rural Connections uh, uh, out of Utah that was come out this uh, last summer, 
uh, I like this term uh, that people have a finite pool of worry. And so when you get these things like climate change or some rather alarming change, and, and if you just try to add that, it's going to go to the bottom of the, of the uh, pool of worry because we have a lot of other more immediate concerns. And if the information isn't clear and it's just coming as an addition, an add-on, um, you know, we're not likely to integrate it into our decision making. So really the way to deal with something like this is to integrate it into what you are doing now and not as an add-on. And I'll talk more about kind of what I mean by that. Another aspect that comes from really the social science and looking at this is, and also what we ought to be aware of already in extension particularly, is that um, you know, our land managers and clientele are, are much more likely to be using information if they've been in on it, defining the needs, developing uh, the information, providing that input on, on the tools and the science that's important. Uh, if they're participating in co-producing, is it maybe a term, uh, that information, if it's just something that comes to them you know, from a black box and uh, perhaps out left, from left field, uh, it's not likely to be used. And so clearly extension is one of the you know, best organizations perhaps or ought to be in a good position uh, to do this, to help with this integration, to help with this more uh, participatory um, work with the science and developing tools from the science. And if you look, kind of, we have a fairly classic case in this uh, climate change uh, challenge that we often do tend to see science uh, develop in this linear track, the communication coming from you know science-based sources. Uh, then we develop the message, and then we start to push it out to the clients because this is important. You ought to know about this, and here you, here's uh, what we think we know about it. Now you take this information and, and take action on the ground. Um, the phrase that's used is sort of this, if we got this wrong, then we keep pushing more and more information, and if there's not a response, we just push more information. Um, and really, that's the wrong uh, approach because uh, you know it's the connection that's not being made. It's not so much that the information um, isn't good. We really need to be, particularly again in extension, uh, using more of a user-centered communication plan. And uh, this came from a paper by Joe Cohn, but you know many others are looking at it this way. That it's really just the pathway and the way we try to communicate. And again, obviously having more of a participatory. Um, engagement with users uh, so that it's not just the science proceeding down that linear track. You know, I should say we often end up using this more linear approach and, and we can get away with it, especially if the client is really looking for that information. They want it really bad. And even if um, it's not the best mode of delivery, it'll still work. And so we, we often do kind of get stuck in this track. But particularly with climate science and some of the more controversial aspects of it, uh, we really have to start here or we fail if we don't have a pretty good model of putting the user kind of in the middle of this and really designing our communication, working a little bit harder on, uh, on the communication itself. Because a lot of people aren't asking for this information, and yet we might want it there in a usable form for them when they do. We looked at this, uh, as I mentioned before, in a regional assessment uh, of the about 24 different focus groups uh, with hundreds of different uh, uh, landowners, mostly non-industrial landowners, and really kind of painted a similar picture that we'd seen in some other studies. Um, a fair amount of, of mistrust and a lot of questions about interpreting science, and of course then a lot of them saying we need extension to help us, where are you? Um, also the complexity being overwhelming, uh, and then this challenge of taking global uh, and even regional scenarios, and when does it get down on the ground so that you might uh, use it in looking at a particular management unit, uh, one side of the hill versus the other. Uh, but something that's pretty clear is that if we, we do get it right and are engaging people with local uh, relevant issues and incorporating climate into the discussion, but not as the whole reason to be there, uh, we'll be more successful. And so that's kind of the main recommendation there is uh, starting with your local information, your local resource people, uh, what they already know about their climate and variability and extremes, and integrate this uh, climate science, the new science that comes out, into a fairly natural discussion of ecology, silviculture, soils, productivity, and climate, uh, but not as some grand standalone come here about climate change. 
And then this aspect about being more participatory and getting together in a collaborative mode uh, is another key thing. It's something we should always do in extension, but it's pretty much um, going to be success or failure in the case of climate change information. Uh, we have to do it. So it, it does often come back to this, though. If you don't have a clear uh, signal or a real you know, motivation, uh, folks aren't going to be asking or that interested about climate change. Uh, so back to this map, where are we on this map? And in my case, uh, really, this is not climate change does not show up on people's list of concerns if I do needs assessments in my area. Um, but a way to start, something that everyone is interested in, is looking at, you know, how does the local climate work? And this is something I found in common with climate outreach around the country. Is it's certainly got our attention uh, when we have uh, more and more extreme events and maybe you know, there is a signal um, and learning about how the system works in this case looking at a map of uh, my area in the Pacific Northwest and you know how has the weather uh, on average which is climate how has that changed um, and, and you see these larger red circles mean that there has been a significant you know warming of about a degree um, you know over the last uh, what is it, 1916 to 2006, um, a few places where there hasn't been. Uh, so it's making it local and relevant. You know, how do these things like our great coastal gale and the large, uh, heavy rainstorms and windstorms, how are they set up? Um, and why are they getting more extreme? Or maybe not necessarily why, but even just how does it work and uh, how often has it happened? And looking at, oh, here's how our system works in the Pacific. Um, and those amazing storms with that warm tropical air colliding with the cold uh, northern Pacific flow uh, that just really turns a fire hose onto some part of the west coast, particularly the northwest coast. Well, that's how we get um, that intense rainfall. And a key part of this, too, in sorting out this signal is the, the things, the background things, such as the El Nino and the La Nina and the uh, more decadal changes. Uh, this is an example just in how our weather works on the west coast. If you look over here, there was an El Nino year, 97, and our ocean temperatures and upwelling of the waters off the coast really control our, um, our weather up to hundreds of miles inland. And so that year we had uh, much warmer than average on the order of 5 to 6 degrees warmer ocean upwelling. Our water was in the 60s off of the North Oregon coast uh, in an El Nino year had a pretty large effect on our weather. And, and then the very next year we had a La Nina and it was five or six degrees below normal in the ocean uh, and it was a much different type of, of year. And, and how often do those things happen and how that might that change in the future. And one of the things that we can start looking at is our, what we're used to here on the uh, west coast is the coastal fog and the, the cool moderate temperatures, the coastal proximity index here by the green uh, colors, the you can see we're usually about 10 to 20 degrees cooler uh, on the west side of the coast range than we are over here in our valley on the east side of our coast range. And there's a pretty steep gradient there. Um, how will that change in the future? And they've got some pretty good ideas of how the climate system works and how it might change uh, with changes in our weather. And then on the ground, we really get to where it's important. Uh, the the, the valley where cold air pools versus the mid-slope where we actually see a lot more warming and drought influences and how that's going to play out, um, you know, if there's a, a directional change in our weather or climate. And that's the kind of thing, uh, maybe over the next several years, we pay more attention to that and we incorporate some scenarios about the direction of change and how that might change, you know, the range that we're used to. And that seems like a fairly universal uh, finding that that's a good place to start with integrating climate and climate science. Um, another thing that everyone had in common across the range of you know opinions about climate change is that we all do want to take positive action towards sustainable management, uh, and it's easy enough to incorporate climate information in that discussion. It's not about climate change; it's really about knowing your land, improving your management, and your understanding of that environment. And we can incorporate climate in climate change into that conversation fairly naturally with a diverse audience. And so that really is kind of where we end up. Our strategy is 
uh, integrate the climate change information and that variability into our basic environmental uh, information into the tools and, and programs that we use to inform our production and our planning for agriculture and forestry. Um, it's not going to be a standalone uh, come learn about climate change. And so certainly that's how we approach developing our tools. And this part about the collaborative and the participatory process, uh, really getting researchers and educators and land managers all together on that uh, is a part, a key part. And I think Extension, again, needs to ramp up the effort there. And avoiding the black box uh, and really the too much too fast, which was my example from the seed zone selection tool. That was just too much too fast. And it was a black box, and we really want to know and want to be in on the development of that so we really understand appropriate use and, and where it came from. I did want to refer to this, um, the e-extension community of practice uh, website that's under development. And it's something that you might want to consider um, integrating into your communication uh, around your, your Southern Pine project. And some of you are probably involved in this. Uh, and the URL is there, and we can post that in the chat room if you want as well. So I have another question now, uh, given my emphasis on this engagement of your audience and the landowners. I was looking at your goals with the Southern Pine Project, uh, which is, of course, very similar to goals we'd have here with Douglas Fir, is you know how we're going to enable our landowners to adapt forest management in the face of clim climate change, uh, how we're going to develop tools that they can use. And it's all about communicating uh, with our, our land managers. So there's my question. And this isn't a yes or no answer. So this kind of opens, I think, the microphone discussion. I'm just curious how you've engaged with the landowner audience uh, so far on the subject of climate change, uh, and maybe specifically, you know, for this project, developing your your project proposal. <laughs> 